I can still recall the excitement with which I read an essay in the Voice Literary Supplement back in 1989 concerning the formation of the canon of English literature. Um, it, it was a voice of urgent lucidity, and I knew I must attend, and attend I did. And uh, some years later, I read the great book on which the article was based, Masks of Empire. It was a marvelous analysis of the way in which, as part of the so-called civilizing mission in India, the British had purveyed a canon of English literature, the best that was taught and the best that was said. But what was amazing was that those of us who had read English in this part of the world in universities had no idea at the time we were doing it that all this had been rehearsed, so to speak, in places like India. Some of us might have had our suspicions. Those who read Daniel Corkery would realize, of course, that Gauri Vishwanathan was in many ways the Daniel Corkery of India, who looked at the ways in which the canon could be used to estrange people from their own environment and their own background. But this was one of those epoch-making books of criticism, one of those books which helped to invent post-colonial studies. And it is a pleasure to have its author back again here on the stage of the Abbey, where so much of the cultural critique of colonialism began. Um, Gori is a graduate of Delhi University. She went on to write another stellar book called Outside the Fold, which is a study of the relationship between conversion, modernity, and belief. And once again, the method was supremely dialectical. She, she related the growing recognition in 19th century Britain of minority religions to the experience, so to speak, out in the field, to the experience of conversion, where many missionaries who went perhaps with no political subtext found themselves open to the counterinsurgent appeal of native tradition. And of course, this was a process well known to many persons of Irish background who went to India. One of the first playwrights of this theater, James Cousins, went with his wife Margaret out to India and there, in a sense, continued the critique of colonialism that had begun here. Uh, Greta, uh, Greta Cousins actually wrote the words to the Indian anthem. And the overlap, the complex overlap between theosophy, modernism, uh, and conversion has been one of the great subjects of Professor Visvanathan's career, and in particular of that wonderful book, Outside the Fold, which won so many prizes. But it is a book that begins with the conversion experience of John Henry Newman who did so much to create an intelligentsia in this country and whose work was quite far-reaching in its implications. Gori has also edited a book of interviews with Edward Said. And indeed, it was Edward who first kindly introduced me to her. And it was a great pleasure always to hear her speak. Uh, here or in other countries, she has always lifted the hearts of her students because I think in her work, interpretive audacity is combined with sound scholarly scruple. Um, she's worked more recently on the meanings of secularism and on the links, as I say, between theosophy and modernist art. Edward always liked to use the word secular, as we know, before the word criticism. And I think at times he liked to pretend it was a wholly secular activity. But Gori Vishwanathan knows, as he did, that secularism can have little meaning outside of the religious context to which it is one of many responses. Uh, we in Ireland have already learned a great deal from Gori's work, and it is a pleasure now to hear her lecture on nationalism and the politics of spirituality in India and Ireland. Welcome back. It's okay. uh, thank you so much, Declan, for that remarkably generous and uh, kind introduction. Um, I, I really can't adequately um, express how thrilled and honored I am to be here at the uh, 
um, Abbey Theater. Um, Declan was mentioning Edward Said, who was also my um, advisor, PhD advisor, and my very good friend. And, um, and I remember one of the things that um, Edward um, sought to do at Columbia when um, he was given over um, uh, the possibility of transforming um, you know, the small theater that we had at, on campus called the Miller Theater. He said, I want it to be um, uh, on, on the, on the, on the uh, model and scale of the Abbey Theater. That the Abbey Theater he always saw as the kind of gold standard of the kind of work that combines um, intellectual um, rigor and stimulation with creative and artistic uh, development. And, and in the Abbey Theater, um, um, Edward saw um, uh, the, uh, what the future of universities also consisted of. And it's therefore really um, a double honor for me um, to be here because I see myself as in, a, as in, a, as in one major way um, continuing or at least attempting to continue um, um, you know, a, a project which I think was really dear to my, to my friend's heart, to Edward Said's heart. Um, Declan also mentioned um, um, James and Margaret Cousins, and I'm very glad he did because I am going to speak about James Cousins today. I have been working on him for some time, and uh, it was in connection with the project on theosophy and modernism that uh, Declan mentioned. But um, when I was invited to speak here, I, I, I um, thought it might actually be um, really interesting to um, not, not quite bring Coles back to Newcastle, but to you know, resituate James Cousins back in the very world um, uh, in which he grew up, that is here, Dublin, and even more importantly, the Abbey Theatre. Um, but James Cousins' defining moment was his migration to India in 1915, just months before the Easter Rising. And that is really what I would like um, uh, to talk about. Um, I should say that um, perhaps my reason for um, wanting to linger on James Cousins for so long is really because I, I find myself drawn more towards uh, writers and critics who fall between places who are not quite entirely of one place or, or the other, but the writers and artists who, um, through these in-between positions, uh, try to find ways of articulating the goals of literary and critical work that go far beyond national boundaries. Ideas of influence, cultural borrowings, intertextuality, rewritings, and adaptations run throughout James Cousins' work. At the same time, notions of literary influence break down when literary issues that emerge in one context can only be resolved in another. Two such issues are realism and idealism in art and literature. And in what follows, I offer a reading of a period in 20th century history in the interwar era of the 1920s and 1930s, when nationalist movements across Asia were growing and the role of literature in decolonization acquired urgency as a topic of intellectual debate. In the years following the end of World War I, an internationalist vision crept into several anti-colonial movements. The development was not without controversy. To extreme nationalists, internationalism was nothing more than a lofty term that prolonged colonialism indefinitely under the guise of a universal humanism. However, to those who still considered themselves nationalists, but believed they had a responsibility that extended far beyond the immediate goal of liberation from colonial rule, internationalism was the only solution to a world consumed by ethnic fratricide, which threatened to engulf those colonial states aspiring to newfound independence. Therefore, when the Indian poet and Nobel laureate Rabindranath Tagore, who Luke talked about uh, briefly yesterday, 
When Tagore raised his voice in India in behalf of what he called the expanding soul of humanity, the language of universalism that underlined his appeal for some spiritual design of life earned him brickbats from his compatriots who mocked his views as hopelessly romantic and beguiled. Tagore's isolation, especially in India, was all the more pronounced because his stance on internationalism as the political philosophy of the future appeared to converge with that of Europeans then residing in India. Indeed, internationalism appeared to have become the cultural priority of European emigres in India who were neither sympathetic to continuing British colonial rule nor keen on witnessing a violent takeover by extreme nationalists. Movements with a global reach like theosophy gained strength during the same period, advocating a brotherhood of man as a metaphysical counterpart to a British commonwealth destined to supersede empire. The question therefore is, were they simply continuing colonial rule in a different form? Or were they genuinely crafting a worldview that sought an ideal meeting point as much between philosophy and politics as between a narrow provincial nationalism and rank colonialism? Among Tagore's most avid supporters was the Irish poet James Cousins. Born in Belfast in 1873, he left a flourishing poetic career in Dublin and settled in India at the behest of the theosophist Annie Besant, who invited him to be the literary uh, sub-editor of her newspaper, New India. Virtually alone among theosophists, he developed a perspective on war, violence, and fratricide that allowed for a creative synthesis of spirituality and politics and brought him much closer to post-nationalist forms of thinking about decolonization, views that were highly suspect at the time. His sympathy for Tagore was sparked by the hostility shown by many Indians to Tagore's internationalism. To Cousins, the distinction misrepresented the nationalist aspirations of the vast majority of Indians. He joined his voice to Tagore's to argue that by imposing narrowness and exclusiveness on its aims and methods, Indian nationalism proved that its true enemy was not the British, but rather itself. Describing nationalism as, quote, an act of national selfishness, unquote, but without quite dismissing it as false consciousness, Cousins maintained that the emerging anti-colonial sentiment in India had produced a new racialism, what he called the enlargement of consciousness beyond mere personal interest toward the realization of a corporate life in the geographical or racial groupings called nations, unquote. Like Tagore, he maintained that nationalism's self-centeredness cut it off from world unity, turned creative energy into destructive fever, and set up antagonisms, generating more antagonisms. James Cousins's advocacy of internationalism marked the culmination of a poet's career split between Ireland and India. In his native Ireland, Cousins had built an established literary reputation as a prolific author of numerous collections of poems and plays, many of which, by the way, were produced in the Abbey Theater, this very space, uh, the most famous being the racing uh, lug. And Cousins was at the helm of activities, uh, literary activities involving Ireland's cultural renewal. His standing in the Irish literary revival was undisputed. Yet his name drops out of the canon on his departure from Ireland to India in 1915. Though Cousins continued to publish poetry in the four decades he spent in India, uh, he never returned to Ireland, by the way. He remained in India and he died in 1956. Um, though he continued to publish poetry and drama in the years uh, he spent in India, 
Um, this work, along with his a, a voluminous output of literary criticism, has received little, if any, critical attention, even in India, where, on the other hand, his work in education and public service is fondly remembered and celebrated. As far as the rest of the world was concerned, Cousins was a failed poet who had sacrificed whatever talent he had by migrating to India and throwing his lot with an esoteric movement more interested in occult happenings than literary achievements. The label, uh, the Irish poet from India, stuck to him as a derogatory label. Under the circumstances, um, perhaps such a, 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 a derogation might appear justified. After all, the market for poetry is never a certain one, especially the poetry of a man who could not be placed in a single comprehensible tradition of writing. How were Western critics to deal with the work of a man who fused Irish mythological heroes and Hindu deities, or whose sense of poetic location was a blur between Dublin and Madras? Yet until Cousins left Ireland permanently in 1915, he was widely regarded as a promising poet, though perhaps not first rate. He was known but he was not particularly influential on the generation of poets writing contemporaneously. And though disparaged by Yeats and Joyce as a mere versifier, Cousins was nevertheless a respected member of Irish literary and intellectual circles and stood at the forefront of the movement to revive Irish arts. And indeed, even Yeats's and Joyce's contempt for his poetic and dramatic talents was not entirely on aesthetic grounds, since it was also laced by a nervous apprehension about his popular reach. At the Abbey Theatre, Yeats complained that there was, quote, too much cousins, unquote, and a rift developed in the Irish National Theatre movement uh, with two thirds of the actors and writers siding with cousins against uh, Yeats. James Joyce also carped at Cousins for being favored by publishers who at one time rejected Joyce's work and published Cousins's poetry instead. In a string of biting doggerel stanzas, Joyce lampooned what he considered his rival's contrived poetical year, year, and I would refer you to Joyce's um, 1912 broadside, Gas from a Burner, where he has some very salacious uh, uh, verses on uh, James Cousins. Yet for all the sneering by Yeats and Joyce, there was no denying the active involvement of both James and his wife Margaret Cousins in all aspects of Irish political and literary life the full range of which is measured by the embrace of a curious blend of scientific and anti-scientific interests. They were involved in such diverse topics as astrology, theosophy, occultism, vegetarianism, agricultural cooperatives, mythology, the promotion of the Gaelic language, the revival of Irish drama, women's suffrage, anti-imperialism, reincarnation, and anti-vivisection. They were social activists in a way that the better known poets of the time were not. Suffice it to say then that Cousins remained in, others, in other people's shadows all his life, perhaps a, a, achieving some measure of personal recognition only in India, where on the other hand, he was better known for his contributions to education and social service than for his poetry and literary criticism. The relegation of James Cousins to poetic oblivion is accepted with stoic resignation in the following comment by Alan Danson, a compiler of Cousins' published record. And I just want to quote very briefly, he said, words written or spoken by James Cousins or his wife Margaret Cousins were published widespread over three continents and at least eight countries for almost 60 years. If at all, they remembered now only in India. And yet, as the same editor notes in an unabashedly partisan burst of indignant protest against the poet's neglect, quote, whilst Yeats and Joyce lived out their lives in service to their own self-centered ideals, 
Cousins devoted his best energies and his subtlest intellectual powers to the education of the young and the welfare of the poor and the oppressed." Unquote. One important reason for Cousins' marginalization is his own tenuous position within the Theosophical Society, as well as in India under British rule. Though Annie Passant recruited him from Ireland to run her newspaper, New India, she abruptly dismissed him when he wrote a series of trenchant articles on the Easter Rising of 1916. As a result of these fiery articles, Cousins was closely monitor monitored by the British authorities who regarded him as a subversive radical threatening to extend support to Indian uh, uh, ins insurgents. Out of a job and a drift in India, Cousins subsequently uh, accepted a teaching position in a small college several hundred miles north of Madras. Removed from the main center of activities in Madras, where the Theosophical Society was located, and discouraged by the daunting challenges of teaching English poetry in the provinces, Cousins felt acutely marginalized, but never without purpose. He turned his position to good advantage by immersing himself in the educational reconstruction of India, while at the same time fusing his theories of education with sustained work in literary and art criticism. A visiting professorship in Japan at Keio University during the heyday of Japanese modernism in art and literature clarified Cousins' thinking about the potential models India needed most as it struggled to emerge from under the shadow of the West. While in Japan, he met numerous artists, pacifists, and intellectuals who were trying to find a pan-Asian alternative to the incursions of Western civilization. Cousins left an impressionistic account of his visit to Japan in his book, The New Japan, which I strongly believe should be read alongside his works on literary criticism that were inspired by his stay in Japan. His book, The New Japan, is almost unselfconsciously Orientalist in its re relaying of fantasies about Japan. Cousins viewed Japan through the lenses of the nation he encountered in art and literature, and he repeatedly confessed his disappointment at the intrusions of the modern into Japanese life. Meeting for the first time the poet Yoni Noguchi, who had invited him to lecture at Keio University, Cousins was startled to see the poet naturally dressed in a suit, quote, of rather rough English clothing and a bowler hat, the mirror image of an upright Englishman. He was dismayed by what he later called the disease of modernism afflicting the country, contrasting the idealism and calm repose of Japanese art with the modernist distortions to which it had succumbed. I would argue that it is impossible to separate Cousins' response to Japan's modernization from the lectures he gave at Keio University, which he subsequently published in book form as Modern English Poetry, Its Characteristics and Tendencies in 1921. His exposure to the convulsive debates in Japan on the attractions of Western modernization convinced him that India could not go the way of Japan in its uncritical embrace of the West as the source of its own artistic experimentations. He saw in Japan a country that had turned its back on the richness of its own traditions, sacrificing creative inspiration for a hollow imitativeness. This view was to stay with him in his, ex in his exploration of indigenous alternatives to the legacies of Western culture as India emerged from colonial rule, even as he resisted nationalism as a viable political philosophy. And I think this was always the conundrum that Cousins found himself against, even as he was resisting 
um, imitativeness and this kind of uh, willingness to surrender to the compulsions of Western modernism. He was just as um, wary of uh, uh, going the other extreme and um, finding uh, uh, himself trapped by um, nationalism as perhaps the only other um, alternative. Cousins's alienation from the Japanese imitation of the West cannot be separated from his near-Orientalist celebration of Eastern spirituality. Always searching for a positive national outlook in art, which he defined as an enlargement of consciousness, he sought signs of an enlargement of consciousness in Japanese art, but found only negative models. Cousins was all too aware of the political realities that informed his public role as critic and educator. Some of those realities were impressed on him while teaching in Japan. Though invited to teach modern English literature, on his arrival at Keio, he was also asked to teach Irish political history. He wrote, and I quote, I had never had any dealings with politics. The sole book having even a remote bearing on the topic which I had brought with me, and I could not think why I had brought it, was Labor in Irish History by James Connolly, who was executed during the rebellion in Dublin, and whom I had known as a fellow worker for the emancipation of women." Unquote. To the request that he give a series of lectures on Irish political history was added another that he lecture on the political situation in India. And here he remarked, here, too, I was entirely unfurnished in literature, save for the small book, India, a Nation, by Mrs. Basant, a book then proscribed in India and used as a university textbook in Japan, exclamation mark. Indeed, it is in Japan that Cousins began to think simultaneously about the aesthetic and the political, not necessarily to make claims about the political nature of art. Um, but to recognize the fundamental disjunction between the goals of aesthetics and of uh, politics. <coughs> Obviously, J uh, Japan's confrontation with um, modernity runs as a subtext throughout Cousins' book, The New Japan. But it equally informs the lectures he gave at Keio on a topic seemingly far removed from the tumultuous changes of the early 20th century, that is, English literature. The book that came out of those lectures, which I just mentioned, Modern English Poetry, implicitly counterposes Japan's engagement with modernity to the challenges of a post-World War I environment, which introduced profound doubts about into the smug certainties of Western civilization. English literature is relevant for Cousins' cultural analysis of the contemporary scene because it records what he kept referring to as the enlargement of consciousness towards certain ends, one of which he notes with alarm and despair is the corporate grouping of nations along racialized lines. So even as he was giving what he thought were a series of disinterested lectures about English literature, something was going on in his head um, when he began to realize that English literature as a kind of body of work, you know, looked at cum cumulatively, um, was really sort of... Um, um, uh, structured more along the lines of uh, the grouping of nations along these racialized um, um, uh, um, uh, ideas. Um, as he put it, internationalism was never talked about, uh, internationalism was never more talked about, its need never more keenly felt. But he also recognized that the resistance to foreign influences often brought back cultures toward a fierce and defensive patriotism, which, which he described as, quote, a passion of protest, in some cases against voluntary domination by foreign ideals. The substantial body of work that Cousins published in India after his, after his return from Japan represents his attempt to work through issues of realism and idealism 
in art by applying theosophical principles or what he typically called deeper unities in um, literature. Much is made of Cousins' Orientalist fascination with India as the source of a spiritual revival throughout the world. But I'd like to suggest that India served a more utilitarian function in his thought in that India first offered him a way of working through problems of a narrow nationalism in Irish literature, problems he could not resolve simply by mythologizing the Irish past. While like many Anglo-Irish writers of the early 1900s, Cousins also participated in the Irish dramatic movement, writing romantic verse plays based on Celtic myth, such as The Sleep of the King and The Racing Lug, he rejected mythological romance as too local and narrow. He found himself drawn to the larger project of establishing the common foundations of Irish Indian culture as the first step toward the overthrow of colonial rule in both countries. In India, he rewrote some of his earlier Celtic plays, reworking Hindu themes and legends into his new material in plays such as The King's Wife, which is published in 1919. Uh, this, it's a, it, this is a poetic drama based on the life of the Hindu female poet saint Mirabai. Such changes were not well received by Cousins as critics, and there were many in Ireland, who are prone to describing his project of establish, establishing Irish Indian foundations as basically a um, 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 kind of pagan, archaic um, impulse, which went really against the tendencies of, uh, uh, against modernity, progress, rationalism, and materialism associated with the non-Western world. Cousins' move to India during the heyday of the Home Rule movement enabled him to do more than merely participate in the Indians' agitation against British rule. By migrating to India from Ireland, he also sought to shape the literary expression of Indian nationalism by importing into India the concerns of the Irish literary renaissance. By, but while the importation would prove invigorating in some respects, it resulted in a peculiar situation where Cousins' re-mythologizing of the Irish past delinked him from Ireland and left him curiously removed from the realities of both place and time. The continuing use of Irish mythology in Cousins' Indian poems and plays, sometimes with an Indian twist, leads one to ask whether Cousins was as interested in recreating the Ireland of his remembered past as in evoking a different sense of place altogether. In this evocation, Ireland is produced not as a real place, but rather a literary, philosophical, and political concept, just as India, too, for Cousins, had a connotation that far exceeded its geographical delineations. By leaving Ireland, Cousins did not lose his place in the Irish literary canon so much as dislocate the canon itself. Everything that he wrote in Ireland following his poetic career in Ar uh, uh, I'm sorry, everything that he wrote in India following his poetic career in Ireland was displaced and truncated, undermining any claim that he might have had uh, to a place in either Irish or Indian uh, letters. He was forever between places, but never of one or the other. His Irish work was carried over into the Indian context, but only imperfectly and discontinuously. Cousins fell back on a romanticist conception of bringing the creative intuition of the East and the critical intelligence of the West into a synthesis. Philosophically, his interest in Indian thought reflected his inner concern for the recovery of wholeness by civilizations that had forsaken spiritual growth for material progress. Politically, however, he felt such wholeness could be achieved only when colonialism was dismantled. And here resides an intractable, pro intractable problem in his thought, since even when he acknowledged the need to dismantle imperialism, Cousins insisted on seeking solutions outside a political framework. 
while internationalism remained his goal, his attempt to re realize world unity by reviving Indian uh, nativism established a clear-cut polarity between Eastern spirituality and Western materialism. This polarity linked him perhaps self-evidently with English romanticism. Yet at the same time, his own turn to romanticism grew out of his profound revulsion from the horrors of World War I, which filled him with determination to replace narrow national prejudice with a philosophy of internationalism. That is, a philosophy that had an aesthetic content, but a political um, objective. Cousins sought to rehabilitate Indian ideals in the fields of art, literature, and education. But his motivation did not have a nationalist objective, as I have been reiterating um, from um, the start of this paper. Confident that what he called the unitive vision of Indian culture and philosophy could provide an answer to world problems, he saw India as the focal point of a new world reconstruction. He was encouraged to move in an Eastern direction through his study of the works of contemporary Western pacifists and writers like A.E., Edward Car uh, Carpenter, Paul Richard, and Romain Rolland, all of whom affirmed that Asia could be the savior of the war-ridden West. Cousin saw the spiritual, romanticist root in overcoming the yoke of European imperialism, investing in spirituality, a redemptive content that would save Europe from self-destruction and undo the effects of its sustained imperial marauding of other countries. He thus conceived of imperial dismantling less as a cataclysmic gesture of political liberation than the ushering in of a new era of pacifism, internationalism, and romanticism. At this point, I'd like to elaborate on Cousins' very important concept uh, that he drew from Sanskrit poetics, um, which is um, samadarshana, which translates as synthetic vision. And this idea of synthetic vision was very important um, um, for uh, Cousins, and perhaps what he considered to be the most important insight that he had gained from any um, 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 any school of literary uh, uh, criticism. And in Sanskrit poetics, he found exactly that, uh, that notion of samadarshana, synthetic vision. Uh, and he wrote this book called Synthetic Vision, a study in Indian psychology in 1925. This work best demonstrates his deft deployment, deft deployment of his skills as a literary and art critic in the service of world reconstruction. It reveals a carefully considered, if perhaps idiosyncratic, theory about the Indian Renaissance. Against the grain, Cousins argues in this work that nationalism was not the driving goal of India's literary revival as it was in the Irish. Because of a different motivation, the Indian literary Renaissance, he said, followed the exact opposite path of the Irish revival with more fruitful results uh, from Cousins' perspective. While both movements were driven by a common spiritual um, orientation, Irish spirituality, in Cousins' view, had become essentially compromised by the impulses toward what he called a material and self-centered realism. The result was a vicious civil war whose level of violence was made possible, paradoxically, by the driving idealism of Irish nationalism. He insisted, however, that India was not hobbled by such contradictory impulses, tearing between um, realism and idealism. And, and he explains why, uh, well, it's really not quite an explanation so much as a kind of statement, one could say, and we can always talk about this further. He, he, he observed, quote, the renaissances of India have been the recurrent protests of the apprehension of unity against a too elaborate diversity. Thus, for cousins, the Indian renaissance is not a moment of political awakening, but instead the timely reassertion of 
Unity, which he defines in spiritual terms, um, spiritual unity against an all-consuming diversity, which is also, but which is uh, by the other token defined in racial um, terms. Cousins avoids any association of the Indian literary renaissance with nationalism, but rather identifies it with a movement toward aesthetic and philosophical unity. This fundamental difference between the Irish and the Indian renaissances explains for Cousins the differential path of internationalism in the two contexts. To the West, he noted, internationalism is a condition of release from political tyranny. And as he put it, an event subsequent to the victory of the chained Titan over the tyrant Jove. But to the East, he argued, internationalism is not bound by or dependent on a linear time frame for the attainment of political freedom, but has a repetitiveness and cyclical quality, releasing it from world historical trajectories. He concluded in his analysis that the spiritual East's understanding of internationalism would have to be taken as, quote, the measure and test of all movements that take to themselves the sacred name of freedom. In a formulation that scrupulously avoided assigning political meanings altogether, Cousins described the struggle for freedom as essentially an expansion of consciousness. Wherever such inner growth could be accommodated by external conditions, such as at certain periods in history, like the Song era in China, which is the example he gives, the Song era in China between the 10th and the 13th centuries, aesthetics and politics coexisted in perfect synchrony. During such times, human propensities for violence and coercion were kept in check as a matter, of course, by the refinements of cultural expression through literature, music, and art. On the other hand, where external circumstances, such as bureaucratic reason or the uh, colonial state, resisted or opposed the expansive consciousness, the insistent demands of internal growth could only be met by violence. Cousins' cautionary example is the French Revolution. The violence associated with the French Revolution best exemplified for him the fraught consequences of the pursuit of liberty, equality, and fraternity, when its motivating idealism had to contend with those communitarian pressures that were essentially opposed to removing all restrictions on individual development and creating the autonomous individual. Under the weight of such pressures, the tendency to respond, to respond, uh, to respond with what he kept referring to as the instinct of the self, rather than by abstract and universal thinking, compromised the possibilities of realizing the world ideal, which became, in effect, a group demand, an expression of tribalism. <clears throat> the result of the friction between world idealism and political realism was the self-centered nationalism that Cousins uh, bemoaned as a pernicious deviation from the true course of human history. The French Revolution was history's prime example of the reduction of the ideal to the assertion of local narcissistic needs. In Cousins' arresting phrase, the demand for liberty relieved, relieved of the logic of the complete uh, ideal fell from the level of un universal human speech to that of racial and national vernacular. He was so convinced that the rhetoric of racial belonging thwarted the attainment of world unity that the main challenge was to assert the world ideal without submitting to a political framework. For when the quest for freedom is presented in political terms or in terms of a world historical model of progress, as it was in the case of the French Revolution, he believed it could only be expressed in the language of domination and subordination, and that in turn in the language of racialism. As an uh, era of stultified idealism, um, uh, the 18th and 19th centuries had relegated 
aesthetic culture to a matter of taste and refinement, rather than regarding it as a means and expression of human freedom. And, the, and in the last, um, I know I'm running out of time and I just want, I'm just reaching the last part of my um, talk. But, and I wanted to end by coming back to the First World War, which rudely shattered the expected fulfillment of the promises of liberal humanism. Employing a religious vocabulary, Cousins described the World War as a punishment for the ills of colonialism, as the world stretched out in supplication for some attitude to life. In this regard, imperialism is just as bad for the colonizer as it is for the colonized. Imposing on the dominating group, and I quote from Cousins, faults and selfish preoccupations that stand in the way of its attention to the natural evolution of its own national genius and pull it from the path of open rectitude into the twisted byways of dishonest thought, speech, and action in the artificial defense of a false position. War is symptomatic of the world malady introduced into the world by colonialism, for which a world remedy had to be sought. As one of the most ardent exponents of internationalism, James Cousins fervently believed that the horrors of the world, um, uh, war, First World War necessitated a model of world unity. But in developing such a concept philosophically, he believed it was necessary to distinguish between a negative world unity forged by the domination of some countries by one master country, corresponding to the discourse of Orientalism, as Edward Said describes it, and on the other hand, a more positive unity, genuinely expressive of the principle of spiritual oneness, or in other words, a post-Orientalist model for the world that dispensed with unequal power relations. The positive notion of internationalism eschews domination as the principle of relations between nations. It offers a more egalitarian philosophy in which political freedom is attainable as a quest driven not by material, but spiritual needs. In this reworking, culture is the free space between religion and politics. Fused with Tagore's uh, warnings about the dangers of bureaucratic rationality, Cousins recapitulated the romanticist condemnation of nation building at the expense of the elastic and um, expansive spirit of humanity, to quote Tagore again. In Tagore's theory of nationalism, Cousins found the most potent answer to the malaise spawned by the world struggle. And it, it is really by um, finding in um, um, Tagore a resonance um, with, um, the, with what Cousins is describing as his positive world unity, that um, he also sought to um, transcend um, what he initially he saw as um, drove his project, which was to bring to India the concerns of the Irish literary re renaissance and then the other way as well, bringing to Ireland some of the concerns of the uh, Indian uh, literary renaissance. And by you know, coming back to um, Tagore and by finding some point of contact with the idea of this expansiveness of consciousness as the, um, of, uh, the, the fundamental um, premise of uh, human freedom. Um, Cousins, like um, uh, his friend and collaborator Rabindranath Tagore, sought to uh, bring into the world a philosophy of internationalism that he hoped would have far more um, salience um, uh, that would, as, as I think was mentioned yesterday, um, bring the past uh, in a meaningful relationship um, uh, with the future. Um, thank you so much for your patience.
Thank you so much. Uh, this has been, as I knew it would, an inspiration and a marvelous act of recovery, I think. It, it left me wondering how many other writers of the Irish revival cry out for this kind of recovery, and also how wrong we've been sometimes to think of Ireland as setting headlines for India, not just in political but in literary terms, when so much of the feedback is perhaps even more important. Um, we do have time, and I just want to ask you my own quick question. Um, why do you think Yeats was quite as allergic as he was to cousins? I mean, given that Yeats used Indian motifs in his poetry and loved them, given that the, uh, Greta and James Cousins practiced automatic writing and wrote, there's a beautiful description of it in their joint autobiography, We Two Together. Um, given that Yeats said until the Battle of the Boyne, Ireland really belonged to Asia, why would he have so much trouble? Is it because Cousins was a liberationist and Yeats was only a nationalist? Is that really the implication of your talk? Mm. But I actually think you hit, hit it on the nail, and, um, and I think there was something very unsettling in uh, Cousins' literary migrations. But, you know, literal migration, obviously, but also these literary migrations that Yeats was not hmm. able to do or willing to do. And in a sense, it was almost a kind of riposte to Yeats, um, sort of pushing him back into a position that he probably would not have identified himself with, and it sort of exposed um, uh, perhaps the, 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 um, the you know, kind of the extent of his own nationalist um, uh, p uh, position. Uh, and maybe this was exactly what rankled him so much about Cousins, despite the, you know, the fact that he said, well, he's just so minor and yeah. not worth all the attention. But I do think that this really uh, gets to something very fundamental in, in uh, the divide within um, you know, the Irish revival during that period. Mm. It's so interesting that Yeats kept threatening to go to India, but mm -hmm. unlike the Beatles, he never did. <laughs> and, 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 and he eventually had to write a letter of apology, didn't he? Uh, it, it was shortly after he'd had his famous Steinach monkey gland operation. <laughs> And he had said he was going to go east and free himself of all desire. But as a result of this surgical operation, he was inundated by sexual desire <laughs> and couldn't possibly contemplate a visit to India. So you're right, it all remained at the level of conjecture and supposition. The other man had really, yeah, been there. Um, I'm sure there's lots of questions. Can we open it to the floor? Anyone want to ask anything? Yeah. Yes. Given that Cousins lived through some of these events, I'm just curious, do, you know, if, do we know if he saw, sorry, up here, if, if he saw any parallels between Irish and Indian political history in terms of, for example, Daniel O'Connell and Mahatma Gandhi, or the 1916 Rising and the attempt by Suvas Chandra Bose to liberate India during the Second World War, which met with similar levels of success and, I suppose, failure? Mm -hmm. Did he see these parallels? Should we just take yes. a couple of questions? Or? Yes, if, 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 if we can maybe do what Fiat did and take a few questions mm -hmm. at a time, mm -hmm. and then Gori Vishwanathan can give a composite response. Yeah? Um, I, I'd just be interested in knowing what was Cousin's response to what was happening in Russia and the Bolsh Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, which, which you didn't mention, but just in relation to uh, some contrary notions around internationalism and you know international communism, I'd, I'd love to know what he thought about that. Right. Anybody else? Yes. What was Cousins's reaction to the partition of the subcontinent in '47? Just one more in front, yeah, and. Perhaps that will do for Wonderful talk, wonderful morning. On a lighter note, any chance we might hear a few of those verses from guests from a burn room? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I know I have it. I don't think it's... Oh, I do have it here if you want. If you really want me to read this. Pretty salacious. <laughs> well, it's out of copyright now, so you can if you want. Okay. <laughs> Stephen Joyce won't have problems. <clears throat> but maybe you should answer yes. the questions okay, first. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Ah, yes, thank you so much for the, for the questions. Let me first begin with the question about parallels between Irish and uh, Indian political history. Um, it's, it's a very good question because it was not really something that uh, Cousins um, had seriously thought about. But as he noted, it was when he was in Japan giving these lectures um, at Keio University, uh, where he was supposed to speak about uh, English literature, um, but he was also then asked to lecture on Irish um, political history. And it was at that time that he started to um, you know, think transnationally as well, you know, that he made um, um, you know, different, he, you know, he, he wasn't really trying to connect um, you know, what was going on in um, the Irish political struggle with, um, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the Indian uh, freedom movement. But um, it, it was during that period that he you know, also undertook to educate himself much more um, deeply in um, um, the, the uh, histories of the Irish um, uh, political struggle. I should also say that um, um, you know, I've, the Easter Rising was really a pivotal event um, in um, Cousins' life. He wasn't in Ireland at the time, and that's actually what was the most important thing about it. And um, uh, I've, 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 I would say that one reason why um, Cousins was marginalized so much in Irish literary anthologies um, is really because um, you know, Cousins' work, published before he left for India, was just seen as irrelevant to the concerns of um, Irish um, writing after 1916. And somehow, I, uh, Cousins is always seen as irrelevant post-Easter Rising. But uh, I have seen the articles, I read the articles that he wrote for Annie Besant's newspaper, New India, and they were really very, uh, I mean, they showed how he continued to read and keep himself informed. Um, and he wrote this really moving poem about um, his friend, Francis uh, um, Sheehy Skeffington, um, who was killed um, uh, in the rebellion. And um, this was a poem that, um, uh, that he wrote, I think it, it first came out in New India. Um, uh, and you know, and uh, alongside the articles where he was reporting on and commenting on the um, Easter uh, Rebellion, um, it was really those articles that um, you know caused much distress in the Theosophical Society because, the, as it is, they were under s suspicion by the British for um, spawning all kinds of. Uh, uh, insurgent movements in India, which is really not true, because the Theosophical Society had already become a little bit insular by that time. Cousins was actually much more activist. He wrote more extensively on political topics, even though he claimed he was not political. He was the one who was writing on these political topics. He wrote this book called War, you know, and he, he found himself deeply engaged with, you know, what the meaning of war was, in, in, in a way that I, I really have not seen um, in any of the theosophists of that time. But in any case, to, uh, to go back to those articles in the, uh, in, uh, about the Easter Rising, um, that, uh, you know, those articles are really what um, caused him to uh, be expelled from the Theosophical Society. And so that even within India, he remained really a kind of exile within this already exilic um, uh, space, you know, sort of banished to the hinterland. Um, and, uh, and, but it, and I think all of these events had the effect of making him um, not at all turn his um, back on uh, political activism, but it made him want to, you know, find different ways of expressing that political activism. In, uh, an, in, in a manner that he thought could perhaps be more, more fruitful. And that's really what he uh, you know, took up in his book on, on war, which was in, in, inspired both by the Easter uh, uh, Rising as well as by 
the First World War at, at large. It was really an attempt to find a way of thinking um, uh, about war. So that the, um, uh, you know, the question that you asked about the parallels between Irish and um, Indian political history were noted by cousins, but um, he refused to remain restricted to what the facts said. And instead, he wanted to move beyond those details to try to find some, you know, what he kept referring to really as a kind of abstraction of, of, uh, of ideals. Um, the Bolshevik revo Revolution, you know, I have, this is a really good question because um, whenever I think about internationalism, obviously I would want to filter it through inter internationalism as it is coming out of um, the Bolshevist um, uh, uh, rhetoric. And, but the internationalism that we are hearing from Cousins, from Tagore, from you know Romain Rolland, you know writing at the same time, you know the uh, you know pacifists and uh, writers who were sort of ranged uh, uh, around these uh, common um, uh, themes, that internationalism seems to have a very different content and a, and a different semantics, I would I would say, than internationalism as it's coming out of. Um, the uh, uh, Bolshevik Revolution. The only point of contact that I see uh, Cousins um, willing to make, and he really does not talk about the Bolshevik Revolution, and at least what I, uh, I've, I've read, and I, I'm, I, mean, certainly, I, I could certainly be wrong, and I'd be very happy to be corrected on this. But I think the one thing that he did connect uh, with uh, from this uh, sort of the other idea of internationalism was workers' collectives, which he and his wife, you know, you mentioned Margaret in the beginning, uh, but both of them were deeply engaged with workers' collectives when they were in Dublin. And um, this was something that still continued to um, interest uh, uh, cousins. And it was the ideas that were coming to him um, from his engagement with the workers' collectives that he sought to incorporate into this other idea of internationalism that I'm describing here. Reaction to partition, uh, that's an intriguing question because um, I mean, he died in 1956, as I said, uh, which was you know, well after um, partition had taken place. And everything that Cousins had written would um, um, you know, seem to indicate that um, you know, partition was really uh, uh, exactly the opposite of what he was hoping to usher in through this, through this new internationalist um, 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 age. And, you know, like Tagore, who was writing at um, the same time um, about uh, internationalism as, you know, a necessity in, in light of what was happening in Bengal with the partition of Bengal. Those of you who are familiar with Tagore's novel, The Home and the World, will recall that um, uh, for uh, Tagore, um, you know, the, the central character in his novel, Nikhil, seems almost reactionary in the language that we might use today to describe someone who's um, um, sort of, uh, you know, fighting the, the nationalists, you know, fighting the the Swadeshi movement, you know, Swadeshi meaning, you know, the economic self-sufficiency, you know, people who were boycotting uh, Western goods, um, burning clothes that were manufactured uh, in Lancaster and uh, Manchester. So it's the, it's the economic boycott of Western products that was really the uh, uh, mainstay of um, the Swadeshi uh, movement. And the central character in the novel uh, is really fighting against that um, economic boycott. Why? Because he said the people who are most affected by the economic boycott, not the British, but it's the Muslims, you know, the uh, poor weavers who tended to be, you know, these Bengali we um, uh, Muslims, and that the boycott of, um, um, <clears throat> of um, goods by um, uh, the British 
um, uh, sorry, not just the Muslim weavers, but also the Muslim merchants, you know, the ones whose shops uh, were filled with these, with these goods. He said that if you looked at the economic situation of Bengal, you will find that these are the people who are most affected by, um, you know, um, by the national struggle. So that the opposition really became about, uh, uh, about the majoritarian Hindu community and the minority uh, Muslim community. And to go, I'm sorry, uh, cousins to some extent, um, but not really to a huge extent, I, I should say. And nothing that I've read uh, in his work suggests that partition, um, um, you, know, um, you know, partition engages attention in such a way that he wanted to write extensively about it, other than to say that the uh, fate of the Indian nation after 1947 flew in the face of everything that he and Tagore had hoped would be the outcome of an internationalist philosophy. Well, Gori, you've been very generous and wide-ranging in your answers, and like all great teachers, you, like Tagore and the others, you have the gift of explanation without simplification. Thank you so much for coming so far to remind us of obviously a signature writer. And there was a, a lovely sentence you quoted from him, maybe we could end on, because I think it's a good motto for all cultural workers, that culture is the free space between religion and politics. It's a good thought on which to go to lunch. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you so much.